Awesome. Hey, Jeremy, how are you doing tonight? Well, I'm doing fine. How about you? Well, you know what? I, I couldn't I couldn't say I could be any better right now. I mean, I've had a little rough time. I lost my dog Friday, but, you know, he passed. But other than that, my birthday weekend was amazing. Got to investigate a really cool location in Arkansas. So I had a pretty good time. How was your weekend? Oh, pretty good. I can kind of relate to losing a pet. We have here, we have five dogs and two pigs. Oh, boy. <laughs> yes. We have uh, two two dogs are inside and two pigs are inside. So, oh, that's yeah, great. They're, uh, they're like members of the family. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, my birthday was actually Thursday, and, and he was kind of feeling kind of crappy that day, but then I woke up Friday, and he had passed sometime in the middle of the night, so I couldn't really, like, process it. I had two friends here, and we had to take off early for Arkansas, so I didn't even really have time to let it sink in, you know? So yeah. it's been kind of sinking in the last two days, but I'm I'm going to be okay. I know he's doing good, and I can still communicate with him. I have friends that do stuff like that, don't we all? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, uh, Jeremy, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. And uh, I said you were the founder of Ghost Quest Prayer, but tell them about how, you know, all that's going and how that got started. Oh, uh, well, actually, the funny thing about how I got started in the paranormal investigation was really by accident. Uh, I never really thought too much about, you know, ghost spirits and stuff until uh, me and my cousin about, let's see, I think it was 2006, uh, we was watching Ghost Hunters on TV. Uh, he had ordered a camera because he likes to film himself doing everything. Uh, well, they, they, they messed the shipment up and they sent him a camera that had IR on it. And, uh, that, the night that it came in, uh, we was watching Ghost Adventures, no, it was Ghost Hunters, not Ghost Adventures on TV. Um, we had the bright idea we were going to go play Ghost Hunters in a local cemetery. So that's what we did. We went to the family cemetery about 20 minutes from where we live. Uh, we played around out there, and uh, a couple weeks later, his uh, girlfriend happened to go through the footage. She got bored. You know, she was a stay-at-home mom. She was going through the footage, and we actually had captured a, a full-body apparition of a woman. Um, it was funny because it was like smoke would farm, and it farmed a woman, and the woman took about four steps, and then it just the smoke just, you know, evaporated like this. Oh, wow. Right. So, you know, right then and there we were hooked. We were like, wow, man, we, 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 want, to, we want to catch this again. So <laughs> we formed uh, the Paranormal Society of Pachatula, um, which, I mean, took off like a rocket. I mean, we started, we, we got a Facebook page. Within a matter of a year, we were over 5,000 uh, f- friends. Uh, so then we started a like page, and within six months of that, we had 5,000 people on a like page. And, uh, I mean, we were getting call after call after call. I mean, we almost felt like rock stars, you know. I mean, right. you, would go to town, you would go to town, everybody know who you are. They want to tell you their stories, and then... Uh, we got in contact with a uh, a local uh, TV network that's in Hammond, Louisiana, which is adjacent to Pochettola, and uh, they wanted to do a local TV show. Um, so we done that. Um, our uh, first um, episode was uh, Haunted Bear Creek, which Bear Creek is a uh, it's an old Western bar. Uh, that a lot of uh, famous people had actually sung it. Kenny Rogers was there. Um, a lot of the, the older country stars, before they made it really big, they all played at Bear Creek. Well, you know, Bear Creek's been around for probably 75 years, and uh, they had an apparition of a woman that people that worked in the bar after hours, they would see. Well, anyway, that was our first uh, investigation we did for the TV show, and we had a... Uh, Chris Gray, which um, he actually went to Nashville. He put a record out. Uh, he's he's not real popular, you know, but around these parts, you know, he's a big deal. 
um, we done that. Um, next thing you know, we were doing plantations. Um, have you ever seen the movie The Skeleton Key? Yes, yes, I have. I love that movie, actually. What's that? And it's 12 Years a Slave. The house that, that was found for both those movies, we actually investigated it twice. Uh, wow. beautiful, beautiful house, beautiful house. Uh, we also done the sister plantation to that, which is uh, part of the St. Joseph plantation. Uh, we done the Myrtles, uh, and which I'm sure everybody knows what the Myrtles is. We didn't really catch much there. Uh, we yeah, I haven't caught a whole lot there either. You know, I've been there three times, and I've had a couple of experiences, but they were just like, not anything to write home about, you know what I mean? Right, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly what you mean. But the Myrtles, in my opinion, and I believe the Myrtles is, is haunted, don't get me wrong, but I don't believe that everybody that goes there has a paranormal experience. I mean, it just comes with hype, you know. People go there, yeah, yeah, yeah. the fire, something, so any little thing that happens, they think they have a paranormal experience. I mean, exactly. you know, it's a tourist attraction. That, that's what it is. Uh, but long story short, uh, along came with success, came egos. Um, so I got enough of the egos, which in the paranormal field, unfortunately, that happens a lot. <laughs> uh, so I left uh, PST, which is Paranormal Saturday Punch Tour, in uh, 2012, and I formed Ghost Quest Paranormal. Uh, one of the main reasons why I uh, formed Ghost Quest Paranormal was, uh, which is really our most uh, popular investigation that we've done, um, the series was, the show was actually on um, on the uh, show When Ghost Attack that comes on the Destination America. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, actually, I, I have heard about it. I have never no. gotten to watch it, but I have heard about it. Well, we call it the Joy Stinson case. Uh, Joy Stinson was a woman that lived in a small town, small country town. When you think country, um, country town, that, that's where she lived. Well, anyway, um, she went to the Myrtle Plantation. Um, well, first she got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Um, right. And she was a nurse, very intelligent woman, uh, very religious, comes from a real religious background. Uh, she she got down with Parkinson's disease, kind of got her down. Uh, her and a couple of friends went to the Myrtle Plantation that she works with. She was a nurse. She was an RN. And shortly after coming back home, things started happening in her house. Um, what had happened was she claimed she had she had a uh, separate captured a uh, face and arm on the front porch of the Myrtle. And soon she became obsessed with this orb. And at the time, I thought that that was the reason, you know, what happened. She had opened up a door. Because any time you focus all your energy on something like that, you're opening up the door. And unfortunately, you can't control what comes through that. Right, right. And so they called us in. I was still with uh, PST at the time. They called us in the very first time. Um... Uh, what was really strange was when we got there that night, um, we done a K2 session um, in, in the child's room. Now, we're sitting there, and we're, we're asking questions, and, and both K2, I had a K2 meter, and my partner had a K2 meter at the same, and they were both going off, you know, at the same time. Right. Um, as, as soon as he used the word God, everything stopped. Complete silence. And we hear this little voice. The mean man's outside now. The whole time we were in this room, we did not realize that her three-year-old child was sleeping in the bed. Okay, we, we were in this room for about 35 minutes and never realized the kid was in the bed because, you know, you're in the dark, for one. And uh, we, were <laughs> what we were doing. That's a little surprise. <laughs> yes. So... Uh, what we were trying, what we were trying to do that night was, when somebody calls you to a case, you know, people can call you for different reasons. So your house is haunted. Uh, you got a lot of equipment you got to set up. So we always try to go there first and right. check it out to make sure it's legit before we bring in the whole team. Well, that night when we got ready to leave, which was one of the most strangest experiences I've ever experienced in my life, there was not a cloud in the sky. Okay, there was just black cloud directly on top of this house. 
And I remember the wind was blowing so hard, I seen garbage cans fly across the yard. Um, like I said, just in that house, it was like something didn't want us there. And the vehicle that we were in had power locks, and the locks kept going up and down until we got a little ways down the road. We didn't want to go back, okay? So TST wasn't, look, we just went and filmed ghosts. We didn't know how to get rid of these things, you yeah. know? And so we brought in the team the following week. After we didn't want to go back, but we felt we did. And in the house that night, I had seen my first full-blown apparition that I've ever seen in my life. You know, up until that point, I can't say that I was a 100% believer because, you know, your equipment tells you one thing, but you always have that in the back of your mind. Well, what if this is making it do this? Right. Yeah. Exactly. What I've seen, I would describe it as not human. Um, it was about seven foot tall. He was real, real skinny, seven foot tall. He was bald. His head was shaped like an egg, and what, what his face was real distorted. Um, what made him really strange was his arms, as he was standing there, came past his kneecaps. He had extremely long arms, and the fingers were extremely long. But did he uh, look humanoid, or did he look like more like an alien type creature to you? He had an egg-shaped head. I would say he uh -huh. was more alien type. Uh, yeah, with those long arms, that kind of sounds like, and the long fingers going past the yeah. knees, it kind of sounds like an extraterrestrial type. Right. Look, his face, his face kind of looked, um, uh, now, that, all right, first I have to finish with this before I go into the next part. Okay, so uh, go ahead. <laughs> So, um, whenever, what happened was I was walking through the hallway, and the master bedroom is adjacent from the uh, the uh, bathroom that's in the middle of the, in the middle of the house, pretty much. And my K two meter, as I turned to go into the bathroom, which is straight across from the bedroom, my K two meter went off. It went all the way to red, and it held there for about three seconds. And then I looked up and I saw him standing in the doorway. Um, so, and it's not one of those things that you see off the corner of your eye. I mean, I literally made contact with this thing through the mirror for at least three seconds. It seemed a lot longer than that, but I know for sure it was at least three seconds. So, I got, was scared shitless, okay? I right, never right. experienced anything like that. But at that point in time, I knew I wasn't dealing with, uh, something that was, uh, you know, just an ordinary spirit. Um, we was possibly dealing with something demonic. Uh, so, look, I went through the house and I told them what we seen. We hurried up about our investigation. We got the hell out of there because, like I said, we we just you know we know like they done on ghost adventures. You know, we go and we film. We wasn't expecting anything like that. We didn't know how to help these people. You didn't uh, know how to get rid of it. You could film it and find. Yeah, you know, that there's something there, but your team, you know, that's what a lot of teams, and I'm glad that you, you said that, because a lot of teams have a problem admitting, you know, that they can't do it all. Okay, like right. my team, right. we, we don't do banishings and cleansings and bindings and things like that. We have people that do that for us, that work right. with us to do these things. We're not, we're not experts, and we're not going to say we are, so that's cool that y'all do the same thing. You know what I mean? Right. Y'all did the well, thing or whatever. Well, yeah, well, you see, that, that event kind of led to where I'm at now is because, you know, as time went on after we left, Joy, which was the, the owner of the house, would call me, you know, and, and tell me what was going on. And, um, you know, it got to the point to where she had recordings that she would send me. Uh, one of her daughter being possessed, her daughter was eight years old, and in this audio, you actually hear her daughter saying, I will never leave. This is my house. We're stronger than God now. Okay? Yes. I mean, we were getting wow. some enemy recordings of this and, wow. you know, this, different things. So, look, I didn't know what to do, but this kind of, the fact that I couldn't help this family, Weighed on my mind big time. And my partner at the time, he wasn't interested in learning how to help, actually help these people. 
you know, right. too wrapped up in the, the popularity and all of that. That's what he wanted it for. So I left. I formed Ghost Quest Paranormal. And we went back to Joy's house under Ghost Quest Paranormal. And what was funny was when we done the investigation, you could, you could stand in that house. There was, there was, there was, there were several spirits in the house, excuse me, there were several spirits in the house, but they all seemed to be controlled by this one, which they called the boss. They actually made uh-huh. the boss. And okay. that's the one that I seen. Now, you can go into this house and you can take a picture of a wall, and you will see a face in the wall. Now, that's the, you know, the paranormal investigator, and he says, well, that's just matrixing, okay? That's just just mine trying to make sense of random patterns. But what was funny was he'd stand in the same exact spot 10 minutes later and take another picture. You would have a totally different face. You know, and these were all things that they told us, you know, prior to the investigation that they were having stuff in the walls. Um, so what, what ended up happening was, as, as I was doing the investigation, it didn't make sense to me that all of this was happening because going to the Myrtle's plantation. I was, uh, you know, I was convinced that there was a demonic entity in that house. Because we were doing a uh, uh, spirit box session, and I asked it, what did it want? And it said, kids, kids, kids. And I said, you know, you're a pervert. And it said, F you, three times. Um, wow. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's the, the, those, kind of, those kind of entities that have actually, and I've run into a couple on a couple of our investigations that actually seem to be not ever been human, but they're male they, they show themselves as being a strong, dominant male, and they're right. collecting souls of children, uh, children's spirits. Um, and I think one was actually, you know, keeping control over the children at Ballisca, but I can't prove that. That's just my feelings um, right. and my thoughts because they were afraid to come out of it. There were three little entity, little children, spirits in the closet, but there was an entity in the attic that was kind of controlling and making them be quiet. Um, he was controlling them and they called them right. collectors. So, right. Yeah. Well, that's kind of, kind of same thing that was going on here. But what was very unique is you see, after investigation, like I said, I knew that there, whatever was in this house did not come from the Merrill's plantation. So I went back to joy and I sat her down and I said, joy, I can't help you unless you're 100% honest with me, okay? What happened? Something in your life happened to get us to this point now. And she just kind of hung her head down, and finally she told me that a couple of years prior to this, she went to Honduras on a church mission trip. Um, this is before she got married. She was a virgin. Um that she met a guy in the town where they were staying at. They were real nice. She said these people were real, real nice. You know, they would cater to them. Whatever they wanted, they would get for them. Well, he offered to take her and another girl on a trip around the town. Okay, well, that seems hard. Like she said, she, she's known him all week. They were there for about two weeks. Um, so she went. And somewhere along the line, they got separated from the other girl, and it was just her and him. Well, he led her into what she said was a mud hut, and inside there was a table, and there were two other people there. She said they all three raped her, okay, and they took the blood from her menstrual cycle and put markings on her body while they were raping her. And after they got done, they allowed her to get dressed, and they told her that they were allowing demons in her body. Okay. Oh, Jesus. She, like she says, you're in a foreign country. What are you going to do? Who are you going to go to? She was just happy to get out of there with her, you know, with her. Wow. Yeah, for sure. So, so she said when she returned home, she told her fiance, they got married. Within a year, they had their first child. Within two years, they had their second child. Um, she said small things would happen in the house, but nothing, you know, major would happen. Cattle or whatever. 
Right. They would even joke, oh, you know, the little ghost down there, so whatever. But she says after she went to the Merle's plantation, that's when things started getting bad. Well, my theory is that this thing attached itself. See, an entity cannot just possess you. You have to invite it in. Okay? And I think this thing was attached. She had what you call infestation. And by her going to the Myrtles and becoming obsessed with this this orb, she opened the door. She allowed this thing in. Um, and so with knowing that, we went back, and I demanded that it tell me its name. Because I know through research, because look, whenever I get my mind set on something, girl, I go full blown. I was studying <laughs> everything that I possibly could about demonology. Look, I was running the whole nine yards. So I knew about to get this thing to identify itself that I would have the upper hand. And I did. We finally got it to identify itself. And I did not learn this until about a year later. I was actually watching Paranormal State. Your friend Chip Coffee yeah. ran across this the same entity. Mm-hmm. The same demonic Before, name came across. Yeah. We can't you know what I'm talking about. The A word. Yes. 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 So what happened was I brought in a psychic medium uh, night before. I mean, the next investigation. And we took all the uh, stuff that she was wearing, uh, all the personal belongings she gathered from the church. We burnt it, and we removed it from the property. Now, I wish I could say that that worked, everything was funky going, but we all never know because in the process of when we were doing this, they were selling the house. Now, look, Joy's case was so well known in this small town she lived in. She even got put in a mental institution for a while because people thought she was crazy. Uh, well, don't they think we're crazy? You know, they think right. we're crazy because this is what we do, you know? Oh, yeah. Believe me, I get so, picked on all the time. <laughs> that's all right. They can pick away. We know it's real. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> like I tell them, I said, look, if y'all only knew half the stuff I did, you'd be terrified of sleep at night. Exactly. And the shit that, that, that we've seen, please, they would be, I mean, they can't even go into it. Some of my family... So how do you do that? I go, dude, the creepiest is a better. And they're like, oh, hell no. None, none of my family. Some of them kind of want to go, and then some of them are like, no, nah, there ain't no way. You're nuts. I'm like, well, yeah, we yeah. already knew that. We had a set a long time ago. I'm part of your family, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I always say it's one of those things. Either you absolutely love it or you hate it. I don't think there's no in-between. No, I don't uh-huh. think that, you know, they say, oh, they're just okay. You absolutely love it or you hate it. And once it gets in your blood, there's no way you can turn it off. It I mean, is. You know, I kind of tell it's like a drug. drug. Yeah, exactly. It is. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, like a drug that you have withdrawals if you don't get a scary, spooky investigation doing something within the paranormal once a month. I'm like freaking and now i'm like three weeks out of the month doing paranormal and one week family week you know what i'm saying so i'm kind of yeah trying to balance it out but it's bad. <laughs> yeah a lot but it's yeah, awesome you busy, busy 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 yeah buddy but you but, don't uh, be busy busy next year too so yeah yeah i'm looking forward to it you know i love doing that stuff uh you know and i think i've worked a lot over the years um, I've had some extraordinary cases that a lot of people don't get to to experience. You know, going back to the modern cases, you know, Ghost Quest, that's kind of become our specialty, is dealing with negative hauntings and demonic hauntings. And it's not by choice. It just seems to fell in our that's lives. That's all name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you've heard from Chris Malasa from uh, Paranormal Society in New Orleans the Springfield case. I'm sure you've already talked about that before. Uh, we were involved in that. Uh, you know, it's kind of like these cases you seem to, to find to us. And, you know, I've learned how to do house cleansings and stuff like that. Uh, you know, but the Joyce case, I, I didn't do that because it takes time to learn how to do that stuff. And if you don't know yes. what you're doing, you can actually make don't. things worse. Yeah, you know, that's what I always tell people, you know, like, I, we just went and a couple of weeks ago, me and a, a friend of mine named Jason Black from Tech Park Paranormal, we went and actually spoke to the first paranormal club of this high school down in Houston, in the Houston area. 
and it was such an honor to get to speak to the young adults that are coming up. Um, and they were just like, they cracked me up at first. They were like, hey, have you ever been told you look like Ellen? And I'm like, she's the generous. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, dude, that's awesome. Thank you. But, you know, after we got all that aside, we talked about the paranormal being not, a, a, it's not a game. I mean, this, this shit gets real really quick sometimes. And, you know, I've also told them, you know, the first thing you do is you have to be respectful. You have to be protected in your face. You have to go in there and not be screaming and yelling and demanding because just act and treat them as if it's your grandmother. You know, unless you know that it's demonic, which, you know, they are a few and far between. They're not as many yeah, demonic right, cases right. as there are non-demonic cases. But, you know, right. the TV and stuff shows, and it scares people. So they're immediately afraid of it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, I've only been afraid one time, and that was at the Stanley Hotel a couple of weeks ago. And that that was a very freaky experience. That I, was, I, I was protected. I felt protected. I had everything on. You know, I was... But it it got through. You know, there are things that you that will not play with you, and even if you go in respectfully, some things are ugly and they can jack with you. But we always reiterate how important it is to protect yourself with whatever it is you do: protection prayers, you know, rituals that you do, whatever you're into. You know what I mean? Whatever you feel protected yes. with your higher power or whoever it is. You got to do that. You got to have your faith when you go up against stuff like this because it can get nasty. And right. if you don't and know actually, what you're doing, don't mess with it. You know what right. I mean? And, you know, I can relate to that. Uh, let me tell you a little story. Me and Chris Malone saw the Springfield case. Uh, what happened was they got a call, a couple, a young couple buys their dream home. They get it really, really cheap. This is a five, two story house. I think they pay like $80,000 for it. Uh, strange things start to happen. The husband pulls the carpet up in the, in the upstairs room and there's a satanic pentagram, uh, on the floor underneath the carpet. Uh, long story short, um, we investigated the first night and me and Chris Malonso was going to do a house cleanse. Okay. I didn't protect myself. I was arrogant. Thought I could, I thought I was going to win. Uh, right. We started doing the cleansing and there was a, um, it felt, it was a train, the house started vibrating, um, as if a train was going through the middle of the house, and we heard a loud roaring noise coming up the stairs. Um, I don't think we've ever been so scared in, a, in our life. Well, after we left a couple of days later, you know, everybody's telling me I got a bad attitude. I can't see it, you know. Uh, the only reason I knew something was wrong was because I was experienced enough to identify what was happening. I had passed the church on my job, and I remember getting very, very angry. I was so angry because I seen this cross in front of the church, and I knew right then and there, that ain't me, something's wrong. Right, so right, exactly. I'm going down the road, and I'm demanding this thing identifies itself to me. And in my third eye, I get an image of a name in my mind. So I call Chris, and I tell Chris, Chris, I explain to him what's going on. I said, I want you to look this up and see if this name exists. Okay? So he's like, okay, call me back five minutes later. Yes, that name does exist. So I called Bloody Mary, which is the voodoo priestess of New Orleans. Oh, um, I know. I met her at... Uh... I met her at Andrew Jackson, actually, and watched her bless Hart Fortenberry's Grigory stick. Mm-hmm. She also blessed my friend Scarlett uh, Manicus' uh, Grigory stick, or her little stick, whatever, her protection stick. Um, mm-hmm. It was pretty cool. Uh, she's a cool lady. Actually, I've been trying to get her on my show for a while, you know, just to talk about stuff, because I'm so into learning about all that. Um, not, yes. You know, I just respect it. I need to learn enough. And educate myself enough to, to I respect yeah, you it. See, you know that's, I mean? that's the way I feel about it. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to yeah. do it. I just want to respect it. <laughs> like I look into demonology. I study devil worshiping and stuff like that. Not to do it, but to be knowledgeable right. about what you're doing. Now, look, in the paranormal world, I tell you, you know what's that. knowledge is power. 
It is. Okay, knowledge is power. You have to know, like, uh, for an example, a symbol that may be in a house that looks like a circle with a line through it. It doesn't look like anything. You have to know what that is. You know, that could be a yeah. satanic symbol or something. But, but yeah, anyway, Bloody Mary, I, I contacted her, and she told me what to do. Um, so I followed her instructions, and, and I done what she told me to do. And I was fine after that. So, you know, that goes to show you the dangers. And, and a lot of these young groups that you see popping up everywhere that well, pretty much are the same groups that see dust flying in there and they put it on Facebook and swear to God it's, it's a spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know that's they, they do not know what they're dealing with. And hopefully they only mess with minor stuff to where they never can backfire on them. But look. People are or, or hopefully not a residential that they're stirring shit up and leaving it for the, for okay. the homeowners. You know what I mean? That's what I'm afraid of is that we get a lot of calls having to do cleanup. Like, well, we had this group come out and all they really did was get evidence and then they left and we haven't heard from them since. Um, right. You know, uh, I'll have a case that actually I got handed to me uh, by someone and referred, you know, it was pretty honor. I was honored actually, but. We were referred this case, and we're going to have to go back because the homeowner actually wasn't uh, as adamant about get the hell out of my house, and we think it could have returned. So we're going to have, you know, sometimes you have to do that. You have to do stuff two and three oh, times yeah, because they're nasty. Right. You know what I mean? You're right. But, but very seldom can you go into a house and do a paranormal investigation and free the house of energy in one shot. All we yeah, catch yeah. when we go. Look. It may happen to where we may get rid of it tonight, but don't look for that. It's going to take a couple of times. Yeah, I told I told my whole team when we left, I go, I have this gut feeling that we're going to have to go back. Yeah. So, yeah. It, 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 that's something that a lot of these young groups don't know. And unfortunately, see, I was one of those people at one time. So I can yeah, talk to, to these people, but yeah. at the same time, you know, you have if you're really serious and you really want to be in the field and you want people to take you serious, you gotta educate yourself. You know? Well yeah, I mean you what are the veterans? Why don't you from what every, the veterans oh, do? Right. Yeah. And every time you go in a house, you're not gonna catch all this awesome evidence to put on Facebook. Oh god, no. You're not gonna find that, you know? No. No. There's more times of, sno- of wanting to snooze on investigations and shit that actually happens, and you're going, oh, my God. Oh, I know. But, you know, lately, it, is, it has, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it had something to do with the, the moon thing and all that crap or retrograde or whatever was going on, you know, Mercury and retrograde or whatever was happening. But lately, the activity's been off the chain. Um and then it'll just kind of go away. It's like this burst of energy, and then it goes away. But I always uh, find that you get more activity during the winter time than you do the summertime. But it's isn't that weird? I mean, I do live in the south, so during the summertime, it's hot, hot, hot down here. So I don't go <laughs> They're like, the screw this. Time. Screw yeah. this. We're going north, man. That's why Illinois and, and all them places up there have so many uh, paracons and stuff during the summer, and we don't because... You know, they got activity going on because the, the spirits all said, to hell with the south. It's too damn hot down here. We're going up there where it's kind of chill, you know. So, yeah. what, what, you know, what is going on with this Julia Brown? Can you tell us a little bit about the Julia Brown thing? Because I kind of wanted to touch on that a little bit. Sure, and sure. then I wanted to talk a little bit about Floss before we, we have sure. to go. So, uh, Julia Brown, Frenier was a town that got wiped away by a hurricane in 1915. Um, it's off the uh, lake shore of Lake Pontchartrain, Train, which is in a swamp. They actually right. call it Dead Man Swamp. Uh, it's most possibly one of the most haunted swamps in America, which is no more than five miles down the road from my house. Uh, you know, I actually heard about Julia Brown through a friend of mine one night. We were talking, and... Uh, he, he, he was like, have you ever heard of the legend of Julia Brown and Frenier? And I was like, no. You know, he just kind of said that there was an old woman that lived in the swamp. And, uh, you know, she used to sing a song that when she died, she was going to take the whole town with her. And Hurricane wiped the town out later. That's not all, you know, we talked about. So I started asking 
the local elders in the town about Julia Brown and, and Fenier. What was funny was nobody really knew. Nobody even really heard of Fenier. So we started doing a little bit of research, and we found uh, what was possibly the location. Um, it took us three days to actually find the location of where Fenier was. Um, now it's pretty much nothing but swamp. Uh, you can see a couple of pilings sticking out of the water where the town once stood. And through our research, we learned that there was a mass grave out there. That um, a town of 800, uh, no, no, it was 64 people died in the storm. Uh, 24 made it out by a rail car. Um, so... You know, we started doing research and stuff, and we, we through, you know, they say here and there and everywhere, we found the actual graveyard. Uh, the only thing that's left through all the hurricanes that hit was there's a couple of pieces of the old rod iron fence that was sticking out of the ground. You know, and then we actually found one guy that was pretty much a historian of Frenier. And he told us the whole story, you know, about Julia Brown. Julia Brown was a self-declared voodoo priestess. She was a large property owner. She actually owned half of the property in the town. And I would think she become wealthy because this is a black woman in 1915, okay, that was very wealthy. So what happened was the townspeople would come to her, you know, for potions, for being sick or whatever, and they couldn't pay with money. So what they done was they would give her a piece of the pro of their property. That's how she become so wealthy. We okay. took our property owner. Well, sure enough, the day that Julia Brown died, uh, the day after, most of the towns were uh, attending her funeral. The preacher was on the way down from New Orleans by a train. Um, and hurricane hit at twelve o at one o three p.m. our time, the day of her funeral, and the water kept, rose within fifteen feet within the first twenty five minutes, which is really rapid. You know, even even for hurricanes that I've lived through, that's pretty rapid. Um, wow. Most of the uh, town was completely wiped out. Um, within seconds, like I said, the train had actually made it to Fenier when the water rose 15 feet. Um, the only thing that was sticking up was the very top of the train, and 23 people jumped on the train, and they made it to Punchatula. Well, what's funny was the train engineer got fired whenever he got to Punchatula for putting uh, company um, equipment in harm's way, which we thought was really crappy even for that time. Well, the Julia Brown's body was never found. After the hurricane, what they done was the survivors, they, they, they put all the dead body on rafts, they floated them into the lake, and they buried them in a massive grave, which was prior to their grave was an Indian burial site, which even Ooh. makes it more... You know, Ooh, like, on it as hell. <laughs> yeah, anybody knows anything about Native American spirits, it can be very, okay. very aggressive. They uh, can so, be, yes, they can. <laughs> yes, they can be. So, after about two days, we actually found the site. We went there that night. Um, we, we got, I got scratched. I was actually holding a video camera. I wasn't doing anything at the time. I was just sitting there filming, and all of a sudden, I thought a bee had stung me because you're in the swamp. At night, there's all kinds of critters and creatures out there. And then whenever they pulled my shirt up, I had three scratch marks on my back. Uh, and, I mean, it burnt, girl. I mean, it was a burn. It was a very intense burning feeling. Uh, wow. We done that. Uh, we done spirit box. And, uh, you know, we got the word Julia come through. And if you watch the actual documentary, when we're doing... I think I did. I actually did watch it, and I saw the well, scratches. That was crazy. Did, did, you, did you hear where, when we first start doing the spirit box, a voice says, hello, and then another voice says, be quiet, and that, that previous voice says, I'm sorry. It's like she was wanting to talk to us, but another spirit was telling her not to. And I, I, heard, I heard, I'm here. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, and then Julia, and then something else. Uh, hate you. 
I hate you or something like that. I mean, yeah, it's like, you. why did you, why, I mean, are you, you asked it, what, what are you trying to do? And it said, I, what's wrong or something? And it said, I hate you. And you said, did y'all hear that? It said, I hate, that even hated me. Yeah, I said, it said something I, very bad. Yeah, it was, it was talking ugly to you. You know, that's, that's kind of weird because when we were at this undisclosed location in Arkansas Saturday night, um, there was an entity that actually scared the shit out of my friend from Louisiana, and he actually chased her, and she had three scratches on both sides of her back. One actually oh. took the skin up, like it like ripped her skin, and it dug into her, and it was like it was short, and it was trying to grab at her, like around her around her side. You know what I mean? Like around her rib right. cage. You know, just on both sides, she had three scratches. And the girl was hysterical. It was scary as shit. Well, you know, I protected myself, and I, I have this uh, this thing I do. And I go down there, and I'm like, look. You know, it was down in the basement area, and it, there's got these jars of these baby parts and stuff hanging. It's really kind of freaky and stuff. But it, right. it used to be a, a haunted, you know, a haunted attraction down there. Right. So it's real freaky anyway, but there's this table that, that you can lay on, and I'm telling you, you can feel it almost vibrating. It has so much energy in it because it, it was an old, you know, hospital for TV, and so there was people there that so many people died there. Right. And this energy, I just kind of said, look, you know, I'm not here to to be ugly to you. Nobody's here to disrespect you. There's no reason for you to hurt my friend, and I don't appreciate it. You know what I mean? If you want to hurt somebody, try somebody else because we're protected by Jesus Christ. And, and I'm here to tell you, he's way stronger than you or whoever you, you know, worship or whatever you worship. You're not going to get through to hurting me. I don't appreciate you hurting my friend. So let's make a deal. I respect you. We respect you. You respect us, okay? We're just here to try to communicate. If you have something to say, we would more, be more than happy to hear it. You know what I mean? But don't hurt my friends. And and we kind of got a little silly with it. I'm not. I'll tell you when we meet in, in Sloss because it's a little not appropriate for right now. But I had everybody turn their recorders off. Let's just say that. And we got a really good laugh. And so the <laughs> the you know he didn't like me. There were three people with dowsing rods, and we were. At, I was asking him questions, and he was answering with the dowsing rods. And I said, "Well, is your intention to hurt someone else in our group tonight?" And uh, all three of them went to yes. And now one of my friends. The one that actually got attacked, her dousing rods got real slow, and when it said, when it would answer, not get through, and you will not hurt me, because I'm not here to hurt you. Let's just get that straight. So if you do, that's not going to look too good on you. So let's just say now, I respect you, you respect me, we're just here to communicate, okay? And he never came after me. Whatever it was never came after me, but he went after my friend, hardcore, to where she was scratched, she was scared, she was, I mean, it was scary. It was really well, scary. Yeah. I but, like you know, that things happen like that, you know? Yeah, and they'll try to go to the weakest link, you know, the person that's yeah. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. you know? But uh, back to Samir, you know, one of the most uh, amazing things about Samir was uh, we went the two nights in a row. Yeah, the second right. night that we went back, there was, when we got there, there was, Children's size footprint. I mean, everywhere. Yeah, I saw it's that. All so, I mean, were you hearing them moving around in the in the grass around y'all, or not, not even hearing that? Well, you know, we the the um the other part of the team was the one that found it. I was on the other side of, of the uh, the grave site whenever it happened. They come and got me. I mean, you can see in the video, and he had two kids out there at all. So Why would I be hanging out in a swamp anyway? <laughs> exactly. You know? Right. Exactly. But, I mean, that was just absolutely amazing because they were everywhere. Uh, you know, and then we, we made the documentary, um, and then, you know, the local newspaper done an article about it. You know, we found a lost town in Samir. So I think that the whole line was Ghost Hunters finds lost town or something like that. I remember. But anyway, a producer got in touch with us from American Supernatural, and they done they done a show about that appeared on the Weather Channel. Right, uh, right. You know, I never realized how many people actually watched the Weather Channel. But when the show come out, I mean, people everywhere was coming. Hey, man, I see you on TV. I watched it. That was that was pretty good. I have to say, they done a really good job. 
on the show. You know, a lot of these people you film for these shows, and you know, like I, I filmed for a show called Swamp Monsters. Um, you know, they they filmed us and they come out looking horrible. <laughs> so you don't know. Well, some people, some people try. To, yeah, it does. Some people can't can't edit correctly, you know what I mean? And some people don't use the correct footage. And, and I, you know, that's what I'm kind of scared of when, you know, getting a show or whatever, if you ever get a show. I don't want to be the one they make to look stupid, you know, no, because I mean, they always, you know what I'm saying? I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that right. guy. You know, so, look stupid. Like Kevin and Randy, I mean, they, there was so much evidence that they collected that they never even put oh. on the show. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. Same thing happened at, you know, Shadows on 66. I mean, we collected a lot more evidence, but you have to have more time than just less than an hour for a documentary, you know what I mean, to put the whole story in there, you know what right. I mean? So right. we, me and Chip got a lot of stuff. Me and Chip and Brad and Barry together got a lot of stuff, but that's just how it's edited sometimes. But, you know, it sucks that we didn't see half the, half the stuff. And that's what I was going to ask you. What didn't we see? on the documentary, and, you you know, did y'all have anything else besides the kids' footprints out there? I mean, did y'all get anything as far as even? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we got, like I said, we were there for for two nights. Um, we actually got a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we actually captured a photograph. One of our team members actually got a photo of what looks like a family. Uh, it looks like uh, two adults and two children you know, standing off in the distance. And as transparent, you pretty much see through them. Um, that, didn't come, that didn't appear on the show. Um, so a lot of the stuff that was captured on the spirit box, which directly relates to the story of Julia Brown, which kind of solidifies it and proves that it actually happened, um, that wasn't That's on the person. show. Right. Well, you see, what happened was the, the show produced where I hold up a voodoo doll, which we did use a voodoo doll, and I said, Julia Brown, this is for you. And that's how I got scratched. And now ah. that's not how I got scratched. I got scratched by holding the camera the way you've seen it. Now, whenever we held the voodoo doll up is whenever we started getting the word, the word Julia Brown. Julia would kept coming through the spirit box. Wow, uh, you know, reaction from the voodoo doll, and wow. none of that was put. You know, none of that was put on there. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff like the actual hardcore evidence that proves that you know the curse of Julia Brown really could have happened. I mean, was it coincidence that a hurricane wiped it out, or was it actually a curse? You know, you know that's, that's kind of cool, and that's the mystery of it all. That's what makes it so cool. Um, yeah, I did watch it, and I was really, I, I didn't really know anything about Julia Brown, but I tried to watch it on YouTube, but I think you have to sign up for something because it kind of tried to screw my computer up when I tried to do the one with, um, it just showed the commercial. Is uh, Bloody right. Mary in the actual episode as well? Yes, Bloody Mary is in the episode. Okay. Yeah, it is uh, so much in the actual commercial, yeah. Like, Bloody Mary just pretty much talks about uh, the voodoo practice and, you know, how powerful the voodoo practice can be, you know, and, and stuff like that. She talked about, you know, and that kind of thing. Some people that think that Julia Brown had ties with Marie Laveau. You see, Marie Laveau died in, eight, in the early 18, in the late 1800s. Julia Brown died in 1915. So yeah. it's very possible that Julia Brown and Marie Laveau could have known one another. Yeah. Uh, uh, which is very interesting. I mean, let me tell you something about Marie Laveau. Marie Laveau is so feared today. Um, and I'm sure you've been in New Orleans. There's pictures of oh, Marie yeah. Laveau everywhere. Oh, and yeah, we yeah. tried to do a documentary on Marie Laveau, and nobody would talk about Marie Laveau on camera. They would talk about her off camera, but they would not dare talk about her on camera. So we had to kind of scrap that project because no one would uh, talk to us about it on camera. Huh. So, yeah. Well, we, you know what? We, we are going to, before we run out, we got about five or eight more minutes, I think. I can't even tell because I can't see. My eyes are going so bad. Um, yeah, we got about six or eight or seven minutes, but I want to talk to you about us going to Sloth Furnace. 
Have you ever been to Sloss Furnace? Now, just so everybody knows, Dark Side Entertainment is putting on an, an amazing event at Sloss Furnace, which is in Birmingham, Alabama, February 13th and 14th, and you can get tickets at Sloss Furnace, uh, their website. Uh, it's, I think it's 80 bucks a day and it's speakers, meet and greet, investigation, all that good stuff. So, um, so what do you, have you ever been to Sloss Furnace, Jeremy? No, I have not. Aha, so we're both going to experience it for the first time together. That is, right. that's kind of cool, right? You so like Blaine Rohan, Blaine Rohan's challenged me to stay in the tunnels. Now, the tunnels have been told are the underneath of the underbelly part of the actual uh, location. Now he yeah. told me that there have been grown ass men to run out screaming like little bitches and crying. So what do you think? What do you think about all that? Have you heard rumors about how haunted this place actually is? Yeah, you know what? Yes, I have. I've heard several uh, stories. I've actually done a little bit of research on it. And, uh, you know, all the tragic deaths and stuff that's happened there. But look, whenever I look at this place through the pictures. I picture a Nightmare on Elm Street movie, okay? <laughs> that is what this place looks like, you know, with the big boilers and everything. And yeah. It, it's just going to be like candy lane, like Christmas to me. You know, right. uh, like you're talking about being in the tunnels and a grown man screaming, terrified. Look, I would love to go down there, and I wouldn't be ashamed to run out of there screaming and crying, but you know what? It will be the most horrifying, most awesome experience that I'll ever have. Exactly, yeah. you know, exactly. That's what, you know, when I went to the Stanley for the Lost Limbs thing, mm -hmm. you know, it was Chip and Ben Hansen and Dana Workman. It was a cool thing. And I was not expect. I was expecting, oh, the Stanley, and I got just that, but much more. And the tunnels at the Stanley were scary as hell, and they were small. Now, this place, Blaine said, is amazingly huge, but it's also so nasty down there that we are supposed to not wear anything we give a damn about wearing again because we're going to get nasty, dirty, gross. Um, and he said to wear boots, and he goes, one chick wore flip-flops, not, not recommended. But this place is supposed to be, and I, and I made a little promo for it. If you guys haven't seen it, you can go on... Uh, uh, the close to death page and look at it and I'll post it again for everybody to see but it kind of shows a little bit of how many miners and how many you know or not you know workers that work there at the furnace you know I guess they were kind of minerish guys um but all these guys that went there they, they didn't get really paid with money um Blaine said they got paid with these little coin things that they had to use right. at the store at the, on at the company store Right. Yeah. That's what they used to do back with the slaves, you know, in the plantation days. Uh, you Hello. know, they, they, you know, after they were freed, they would still work on the plantation, but they wouldn't pay them with money. They would pay them with coins that they can only right. buy stuff at the store that was owned by the plantation. Yeah. So they really were kind of slaves all again, and they, you know, they would take a some kind of a, a truck or boat or something up there and when, the minute they got off the boat and they said you've got a job come with us and then they were like slaves for their whole lives to the, the place they worked and and the money it would just go right back to the actual boss so he got right. he really was actually getting free free labor and making right. a ton of money off of uh, his wares in the store it was really a sad kind of situation so i'm sure there are a lot of entities there that probably not all happy you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I mean, that creates a lot of negative energy and, and you know, and, and stuff like that. Energy never dies. Energy just transforms mm -hmm. itself from one, one thing to another. So, I'm sure there's a lot of energy there. And well, we're going to find out what it's all about. And I'm really excited. I can't wait. I'm a little nervous about uh, speaking publicly because I've only done it once at Chris. But, you know, everybody said I've done a really good job. Um, I'm kind of working on getting my presentation together. I'm actually going to talk about the Joy Stetson case. I'm not going into a little bit more detail than what I did tonight because I'm just trying to come up with it off the top of my head. But, uh, you know, I I'm excited. I, I really am, you know. And, and nothing excites me more than being around other paranormal investigators that, you know, you know that they're the real McCoy, you know. And when you get to investigate with these people and you get to see their techniques and 
how they conduct their, you know, uh, investigation and stuff like that. I mean, I just find it absolutely awesome. Yeah, it's it's a learning thing, and you know, I I have to say that a real big thing I'm, I'm into is the pair unity of it all. You know, there it does exist. It can exist because it exists in my in my world. It does. Um, oh, I investigate with all kinds of people, and the best thing about it is you learn from everybody. So right. I just want to thank you, Jeremy, for being on my show tonight, and I look so forward to meeting you and extremely excited about getting to investigate that really badass place of Fall Furnace with you in February. Yes, indeed. So everybody look up Ghost Quest Paranormal, or is it Ghost Quest Para? How do you have it on it's, your actual uh, page? Actually, we, we have two sites. We have... Uh, the uh, regular page will be Ghost Quest Para, and we have a like page, which is GQT Paranormal. But uh, right. just, just go to the regular one. I don't mess with the like page too much. All right. Thanks, Jeremy, so much. And you have a great week and, uh, and a safe weekend, and I will talk to you soon, buddy. All right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, I appreciate y'all tuning in this week. And next week, my guest is going to be John Emmett. He is the owner of Walk the Mist. He's also a co-host of PSL Live, which is also here on DTM Wicked. And I wanted to say that you need to get your tickets to Sloss Furnace because Jeremy, myself, there will be Riley and um, Stephen Black, there will be just a look for something on Tombstone coming up soon. I will have some owners of some Tombstone locations on my uh, radio show at the end of the uh, month. Again, Floss Furnace, February 13th and 14th. I want to thank my sponsor, Syntex Roof Systems, and also DTM Wicked Radio for having me. Everybody have a great and safe weekend. I mean week, excuse me. Peace out.